Hi, and welcome to this Amatech Land Incorporated webinar. Okay, right now, to get this webinar started, here's your Amatech Land Global Product Manager, Richard Gag. Richard, go right ahead. Good morning, everyone. This is Richard Gag. I'm the Product Manager for Metals with Amatech Land, and I'm based out of our Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania facility. I'd like to thank you for coming to today's presentation. And today, I'm going to be discussing various non-contact temperature measurement locations throughout the iron and steel making processes in a typical integrated steel mill. Land has been directly involved with numerous steel mill temperature measurement solutions since 1947. So, let's get started. The iron and steel making operations in a modern day integrated steel mill require numerous accurate non-contact temperature measurements. Today I will cover some of the most common and most important measurements, the considerations and the application specific solutions from the coke ovens, through the sintering plant, transporting these materials to the blast furnace, and then I cover the blast furnace together with its stoves, liquid iron transportation, and finally, the steel making facility and slag detection. A major component in the iron making process is high quality coke. This is produced in a coking facility and many temperature measurement opportunities exist to increase the production of high quality metallurgical coke. One of the most common measurements on the coke oven are flue temperature measurements and these are measured using a portable infrared thermometer, the Land Cyclops 100L. This feature is accurate through the lens sighting with a fully focusable lens and narrow optical field of view. This allows the operator to measure down the narrow flue with ease. The Cyclops 100L features on board data logging of up to 10,000 temperature measurements. Free to download data analysis software is available for Windows PCs and Android devices. The Cyclops 100L also features wireless Bluetooth communications. No connection cables are there to tangle. Now for those of you who want temperature profiles along the Coke oven sidewalls, we offer fiber optic pyrometer solutions to install within the pusher arm. Typically six systems, three mounted each side in the arm, monitor the wall temperature profiles as the coke is pushed out. At the exit where the coke exits, optional fiber optic thermometers are used. Then after the coke quenching process, Land process thermal imaging devices, like line scanners, detect any uncooled areas within the coke. Finally, as the coke is transferred away on a conveyor, the land hot spotter scanning devices detect any rogue hot inclusions that may still exist, thus preventing fires or belt damage. So as I mentioned, after water quenching, the coke is transported by conveyor. The land hot spotter is capable of detecting very small hot inclusions that may be on the belt. This provides you with belt protection. In a similar way, DRI pellets being transported by a conveyor may also cause damage to the belts. Here, a hot spotter is used to detect hot areas on the belt surface just after the product has left it. The land hot spotter samples 1000 small temperature points within each 80 degree scan across the conveyor. Hot spotter scans at 100 scans per second, and so it is detecting 100,000 temperature samples every second. High speed alarms are generated on detection of just a single small hot inclusion. So the system has very high sensitivity looking for these rogue hot inclusions. 
The sintering plant receives a blend of iron ore, ore fines, calcium or magnesium fluxing agents and coke fines. These are heated at the entry firing hood and then the high temperature layer propagates downwards through the cake by suction from below. The resulting sintered cake is fused and has a more uniform clumped size. This material is efficient and quick to react when charged into the blast furnace. Thermal imaging provides analysis and control for the heating zone propagation down through the sinter coke. So here we see a, a land LSPHD line scanner looking at the coke from above as it enters the sintering hood. Then, as I previously mentioned, hot spotter is used on the conveyors afterwards to detect rogue hot spots that may cause belt damage or fires. So now to the blast furnace. This is where the raw components are combined and under a high pressure, extremely hot air draft, they're converted into liquid iron and slag waste. Non-contact temperature measurements of the incoming hot air blast in the blast main. Thermocouples won't survive in that environment. Uh, they quickly degrade and become unreliable or, or die. In comparison, the land spot fiber optic views a cast hollowed refractory brick that is placed in the main that quickly attains the gas temperature. The spot R100 has a very rapid millisecond response speed and lasts for many years. Some blast furnaces monitor temperatures looking along the axis of a twir. Here, the land spot R100 fiber optic thermometer is perfect. The temperature of the iron that is tapped is also an indication of the desired quality and blast conditions. Continuous non-contact temperature measurement is achieved using a land spot, spot R100 pyrometer. So now we move to the stoves. The stoves act to heat from the blast furnace. They store heat from the blast furnace waste gases. After a period of accumulation, the flow is reversed and that hot stove is used to preheat the incoming air to the blast furnace. Stoves are alternated, storing heat and dissipating heat on a regular flow reversal plan. Refractory surfaces within the stoves are monitored to prevent any over temperature situations that, if unchecked, would lead to refractory wear and premature damage. So here we see a number of spot fiber optic thermometers looking at the top of the refractory checker work and also looking upwards on the inside of the dome refractory lining. Modern blast furnace stoves work at temperatures and pressures which preclude the use of conventional thermocouples since thermocouple metal sheaths are not really viable above 1200 Celsius. Alternative refractory sheaths are easily broken by brickwork movements due to thermal expansion and contraction. Useful life of thermocouple elements is reduced under these high temperature conditions due to contamination and or migration of the tip materials. Under sudden pressure relief, uh, some people refer to this as snorting, thermocouple chilling can produce a drop in reading between 20 and 30 Celsius for about 30 seconds. So this makes the thermocouple signal unsuitable for use in automatic stove changeover reversal control systems. Torpedo cars are typically used to transport molten iron from the blast furnace to the steel making facility. Torpedo cars carry the molten iron to the steel making facility. The cars are typically lined with two or more layers of insulating refractory bricks that keep the hot iron hot and to protect the steel shell of the torpedo car from failing. It's important to monitor the shell temperatures of the torpedo car using the same method every time. In this way, a history of hotspot progression can be developed as the torpedo car's 
pass the same measurement location every time during the day. Running the refractory linings thin on a torpedo car can increase the volume of iron carried. So people attempt to, to do this, but you must have constant and repeatable thermal mapping of the torpedo car shell that will allow you to detect areas that need repair very early. So here, the land ladle safety system features two infrared line scanners, one located each side of the track. These are usually in a small enclosure, which is heated and cooled. And each time a car passes between them, it is thermally scanned. We provide RF transponders that are attached to each torpedo car so that we can identify each car and each side of each car. In this way, a history of thermal hotspot development for each car is saved. So these climate controlled enclosures at each side of the track house the scanners, along with the air purges and the electrical interfaces. We use industry standard fast ethernet to communicate back to the control room. The wide 80 degree vertical scan angle of the scanners and the 1000 temperature points in each 80 degree scan produce extremely high resolution thermal images. These thermal images are 1000 measure points vertical. Once the molten iron arrives at the steel making facility, it's typically transferred to a basic oxygen furnace, a BOF, where it is purified into steel. The land SDSE slag detection system detects the onset of slag carryover rapidly and repeatedly. Slag carryover is reduced compared with other detection methods. Systems pay for themselves in months. During the steel making process, the scrap steel and fluxes are added to the molten iron. Oxygen is blown into the mix and the reaction drives off the carbon. And the fluxes both make the process more thermally efficient by foaming on top of the liquid steel and they capture impurities. At the end of the process, the lightest slag is floating on a layer on top of the molten steel. The vessel is then tilted to start tapping the steel into a ladle. The BOF is designed with a tapping port high in one side. This port allows the underlying molten steel to exit, while the undesired layer of slag remains in the vessel. Only in the last few seconds of the tap does the slag finally reach the tapping port. The land SDSE imager rapidly detects the onset of the slag carryover and provides a much more rapid alarm and indication of the appearance of the slag. This high speed process thermal imaging system has several advantages over conventional methods for slag detection. Being completely non-contact, the SDSE system survives in this harsh environment for many years. And the selected operating wavelength of the SDSE is able to view through films that otherwise make visual observation difficult or impossible. So there we have it. Um, with the SDSE, that automated system makes slag detection with the same rapid operation, regardless of the time of day or the day of the week. There's no difference like with manual detection systems, and there's no chance of operator eyesight damage. There are no expensive disposables like darts or balls. There are no expensive dart loading machines. The system operates in a non-contact safe way that outlasts many BOF relines. So I want to thank everyone again for attending. I've come to the end of this presentation. What I'm now going to do is I'll try and answer some questions that have come in during the presentation. If I don't manage to get to your question, I will respond later 
with an email reply. So again, uh, let me start with these questions. Okay, Richard, thanks very much for moving us into the Q&A portion of this webinar. Okay, so Richard, here's your first question. Why is the Coke oven temperature important? Well, first of all, um, it's important to know the exact temperatures throughout the coke oven so that you achieve complete carbonization. Uh, uniform temperatures also help minimize NOx. They produce a higher quality coke. The refractory brickwork lining uh, in each oven uh, can be extended and you're going to increase coke production from each. Okay, thanks Richard for that answer. Here's another question that an attendee asked. Can you explain more about measurements of the conveyor belts? Uh, there are two main interests with conveyors. The first is detection of rogue uncalled clumps of coke that can cause belt damage uh, or sometimes uh, even worse uh, cause a major fire later in the process. Now the second one uh, commonly done is if you are using DRI pellets transporting them by conveyor they are naturally pyrophoric which mean they can spontaneously heat to a level where they can burn through belts. And so here the use of the land hotspotter scanner, it views the empty belt surface as it starts its return. And any hot impressions left by these pellets on the belt are easily detected. And an alarm can trigger a surface water spray which prevents further heating or damage. Okay, Richard, thanks again for that answer. Let's take a look at your next question. Why would we want to use infrared pyrometers instead of thermocouples for our hot blast stoves? Well, first of all, traditional thermocouples uh, will lose their accuracy over time. At constant high temperatures, the thermocouple tips will migrate and that will require replacement if they're going to stay in calibration. Uh, if you're using ceramic sheaths on the thermocouples, they can easily get cracked or damaged if the brickwork shifts through expansion or contraction. And lastly, with thermocouples, their response speed is very slow. Conversely, pyrometers are non-contact devices, so they last for years. They have the same measurement capabilities and accuracy capabilities years after they are installed. The other th important thing is that they are actually looking at the refractory surface and measuring the temperature of the refractor, which is what you actually want to do. Whereas a thermocouple is measuring the temperature of the atmosphere and you're inferring the temperature of the refractory. So the pyrometers give you an accurate measurement of the refractory. And the other thing is, of course, is that their response speed is in milliseconds. So they're very rapid. OK, thanks, Richard. Great answer. Here's another question that came in. We use a service who uses a thermal camera to inspect our ladle cars. What is different with your system? So if I understand this, um, you probably have a, a, a thermal imaging, a thermographer service that comes in and does inspections. Um, using a thermal imaging survey company is, is much better than doing nothing. Um, but the issues with this are that the surveys are intermittent. Um, if there's different operators doing those surveys, uh, they can vary in the way that they're taken, uh, the angles that people will look at the torpedo car shells, and the data collection and any logging of growth of hotspots, the development of hotspots on each car is inconsistent. Conversely, if you have installed the ladle safety system where they line scatter each side of the track, um, this solution makes the measurements for each and every pass of each torpedo car in the exact same manner. The 
system IDs each car because each car has uh, RF tags attached and a historical database is created for each car. And once again, thank you, Richard. Here's another question. We use darts to prevent slag carryover. Why is your system an advantage? Firstly, a dart is a consumable. Uh, so these things cost, you throw them away every time and your costs continue to increase over time. Um, the dart also needs an expensive machine and a trained operator to ensure that the dart is placed correctly in the tap hole. There are some third party vendors out there who are doing refractory monitoring and refractory supplies. And sometimes they will provide the darts and the machines, but this kind of a service is very costly and, and the service costs are ongoing, they, ne they never end. Now the, the Land SDS is a remote and non-contacting device. Um, there's no ongoing costs after the original system is installed. It's a very fast, it's a very accurate, it's very repeatable and the selected wave band that we use sees through hot CO2 and hot water vapor that may be in the surrounding atmosphere. So you are ignoring a lot of the fumes and getting a continuous reading of the stream itself. The SDS system usually pays for itself in months uh, through savings in additive costs that would be otherwise required to remove the slag. Okay, thanks, Richard, for that answer. Here's another question. Our operator looks at the pore and can detect when slag appears. How is this different? Okay, um, well, traditionally, operators have been used to view the tap and, and uh, they can tell when there is a switch to slag being poured because of the apparent brightness difference. So in this particular case, if we put it simply, the, um, the detector that's used for that type of measurement with the operator is the detector is his eyes. Uh, the processor that processes that information and makes a decision uh, is his brain. And the point at which he decides to tilt the vessel back is his subjective decision. The other thing is that different operators work in different ways. And even the same operator can have bad days. So if it's a Monday morning following the Super Bowl, he may not be as good as he was on the Friday afternoon previously. There are times when there are so many fumes in the area that the operator's view is obscured. And even with dark face shields or goggles, the operator's sight will be damaged over the years. So as again, as I mentioned in my previous answer, the SDS system operates at a selected wave band that sees through hot CO2 and hot water vapor in the atmosphere. Um, it makes the detection very simple, very accurate, very repeatable. The same decisions are made every day of the week, whether it's day or night. And the cost savings because of this accuracy are significant because uh, additives that would normally be put into the steel to remove the slag are no longer necessary or minimized. So the SDS system pays for itself in months. I hope that helps. Okay, and with that, Richard, I'm going to say thank you for that last answer, and we're going to have to wrap up this webinar right there. Richard Gag, thanks very much for sharing your expertise with all of us today. So take care and have yourselves a great day.